So, Estrelita and Izzy, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to our chat. Yeah, we really are looking forward to it, actually, Finn. Likewise, likewise. So could you just kick us off and tell me and everyone who's listening today a little bit about your background and what you guys do today? Okay, do you want to shoot first? Yeah, so I'm Estrelita, and um, I actually originally from uh, South Africa, but I live in the UK now. My background is that I studied medicine in South Africa. I specialized in laboratory medicine uh, and pathology, and I worked for many years in academia. Uh, and then around 15 years ago, I relocated to the UK. And for half of that time, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. And for the latterly, um, I've been really working um, for myself, um, researching nutrition and, and the impact on health. And, and, and that's what I occupy my time with currently. Fascinating. Okay, and my, my name's Izzy. Um, I come to the well-being uh, industry at a fairly late stage in life. Uh, my background is actually real estate. Um, I was involved for uh, quite a few decades in the real estate industry. But the reason I became involved in well-being was actually uh, through a, a personal journey of my own health. I met up with Estrelita and uh, we've been working on this business idea ever since. That's fantastic. So you've got really two sides of the coin there. You've got someone who's who's found their health through the actual anecdotal evidence and going through that journey. And then you've got someone who's worked in the pharmaceutical industry at the sharp end of the stick and in medicine, seeing everyone with their medical issues coming and presenting. So um, I think you've got a great balance there. <laughs> yes, as as do we. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think it brings it brings different aspects to what we do, which, um, you know, keeps it fresh and interesting. Definitely, definitely. So we're here to talk mostly about your book, Eat Well or Die Slowly. Can you tell me what it's about or tell everyone who's listening what it's actually about? So the book is really about the epidemic that we see currently, and it's actually not currently, it's over the last 40, 50 years of chronic diseases escalating globally and the type of diseases we're talking about here is type 2 diabetes, cancer, weight issues, uh, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, many many of these diseases are just as escalating globally um, and there's a reason for this um, and if you really study the science you'll see that the basis of this is um, the unhealthy foods that we eat and started eating for several decades now. So what we try to do is, and this is really a book um, written for the general public, although uh, it will also help introduce uh, the topic to GPs and so on that's not familiar with the signs, um, about what it is that make us sick, and secondly, what we can do to actually um, change that because it's really in our hands. We mm. do not, for these kinds of diseases, need to resort to medication because it's better to try to address the symptoms with medication um, or it's not good to address it with medication, but rather to actually look at the underlying condition mm. and address that. Um, and, and and that's what this book is aimed to inform people. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's really coming to the fore as we see so many different issues coming about. I mean, the, the cost of pharmaceuticals to the taxpayer, the cost of all these different operations and medications and lost productivity and everything in between that we see from the escalation of all these health issues. And I love the title, by the way. I mean, it's quite, it, there's sort of a, a, a quite dark aspect to that. You know, it's eat well or die slowly. And these sort of metabolic conditions are real slow burners and really sap life out of people. I think it was, we, we chose the title because um, it's not just to shock people, but it is actually the reality. You know, it's something that um, 
is developing over time, years or decades. And before, because it's slow developing, most people don't make the association and they don't think that, especially initially, that something is wrong or that I'm not healthy because a lot of this disease is actually subclinical, meaning that we don't see the symptoms and signs in time until it manifests itself in one or more of these diseases later in life. Typically, um, you know, around 40, 40, 50 years of age, these major diseases pre present themselves, but we've actually been metabolically unhealthy for several decades before that. And even young people, you know, in their teens and twenties may already have the underlying unhealthy metabolic condition present. Mm. Yeah, totally. And, and let's just, if we just walk through for people who are slightly, or just coming to grips with the term metabolic health, can you lay that out for us? What is metabolic health? Yeah, it it, it is uh, maybe a bit of a difficult concept, but what we um, mean by metabolism, this is all the processes in our body. Um, you know, the the it's like the engine of a car, if I can maybe make it easy, you know. Um, we need to look after our car. We need to look after the engine of the car. Um, and if we keep that well oiled, if we use the correct fuel to power the car, if we service it um, frequently, you know, we're going to have a healthy car. And it's the same for the body because there's so many complex processes. It's much more complicated than just the car engine. Um, but in order to maintain these processes and keep it in a healthy state, we need to put the correct fuel in our car. So what would happen if, say, for instance, we dri uh, drive a petrol car and we put gasoline in the, uh, sorry, we put um, diesel in the tank? It's not going to work. Mm. And it's the same with our body. If we put the incorrect fuel into our body over time, it's going to break down. And so that is what we call the metabolism okay and and the resulting i mean we can just walk through some of these concepts because we've got metab metabolism and then how would you assess whether someone what, what are the sort of markers you use to assess whether someone is metabolically healthy or metabolically unhealthy if these processes are accumulating over such a long time period we don't want to wait yeah. until we get type 2 diabetes or we don't want to wait until yeah. we get cancer to realize that we're metabolically unhealthy it's an excellent question, Finn, because, I mean, um, uh, not to give it a complicated answer, but let's start with something very simple. Um, and that's usually what we tell people when we talk to them. A very basic thing that people can do is just to look at their body morphology. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people are in fitness and you will understand it from yourself. You know, when we start putting on the extra kilos or pounds, you know, people usually get a little bit um, concerned about that. And that usually takes them off to the gym. And we can sometimes more, not always <laughs> more <laughs> about that. But maybe a very ac accurate thing to to measure is if people just measure their waist in centimeters or inches or whatever, and they uh, measure their height. And then they divide their height into the waist measurement. And if that value is greater than 0 0.5, it means that we have extra fat accumulation. And there's a very specific reason why we take the waist measurement, because that is when we are metabolically unhealthy, where fat accumulates. It accumulates in and around the organs in our abdominal area. So that is a, a, a very, very good indication. You don't have to pay for anything. You can just do it at home. Mm -hmm. There are many other softer signs, you know, 
um, and me metabolism affects our mind and our body. You know, we're talking about aches and pains. Uh, we're talking about a whole host of, you know, diseases and symptoms that people develop. Now, they come in different orders and so on. We've spoken about weight already, weight that you can't get off, you know, accumulation of weight. Um, we can talk about things like mood changes, moodiness, uh, brain fog, gout, um, reflux. Um, we can talk about infertility in men mm. and in uh, women, things like erectile dysfunction, mm. uh, arthritis, gut well, the, problems. The, the fascinating thing about all of these these issues is that they're treated oftentimes individually when you go to a doctor that's where they treat the symptom they say right well you've got arthritis therefore i'm going to medicate you with this whatever this anti-inflammatory or x y and z very rarely are doctors some doctors are i have to say i'm not going to cast all doctors with the same brush but many doctors they don't have enough time and they will just revert to this right well what medication can we give you to treat this symptom so this dietary the impact of our of, of our poor metabolic health is leading to these outcomes so it's just overall health that is just leading to you know screws coming loose on the car or you know the the, the engine backfiring but we're treating the engine backfire we're not treating hang on what are we looking what are we looking for in terms of fuel going in it's a very accurate observation Finn. and the reason for that is unfortunately that this condition is not really discussed or taught at medical school. Certainly not in the years when I studied, but also currently the, the medical curriculum is not geared uh, to teach metabolic health as we understand it. And there are various reasons for it. Um, one of them is that um, because of all these diseases that develop, the pharmaceutical industry obviously have developed a lot of medication to treat each of these. So the medical training is really focused on how to make a diagnosis of a specific disease. And then secondly, which drugs are appropriate to, to uh, treat that specific condition. So prevention is not something um, that's pushed in, in, in the medical curriculum. The other thing is, um, unfortunately, also the pharmaceutical industry has a huge impact on what kind of information is um, uh, covered in lectures and so on in, on in medical schools, because there is that perverse incentive, you know, they also sponsor university medical research and even some of the lecture lecturers as they um, key opinion leaders. So there is really a huge problem in that area, which needs to be urgently addressed. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, the conflicts of interest are, you know, it's not even being alluded to now. I mean, it's just horribly obvious how, Absolutely. how, um, you know, and, and corrupt the governing bodies are as well. You know, sort of we've got the FDA in the in the US and we've got some of the other approval bodies going on that are clearly corrupt as hell, but it's sort of the elephant in the room. And I want to come back to the, that as well, because you've got sections in the book where you address this sort of medical misinformation that we have out there, you know, that, that sort of Ansel Keys and we've got Tim Noakes being silenced. We've got, I, I don't think it's mentioned in the book, but Gary Fetke, like in Australia and all of these sort of areas where there's a real resistance to people understanding the knowledge that you've got in this book. So, and I want to roll back around to that knowledge and, and talk about, we've got, we've, you've outlined, you know, in simple terms, what is metabolic health. And I want to just go on that deeper level because I, as a trainer, I'm often trying to get people to go beyond this energy balance concept, just where it's calories in calories out. It doesn't matter whether you have 10 Mars bars in a day or 10 chicken breasts in a day, as long as you're only having 2000 calories and you're burning off 2100 calories, then you're going to lose weight. And it's just not that simple, but many people want to boil it down to being that simple. So 
I want to go into the concept of, of insulin resistance. So insulin resistance from my top line view is that is what generally ends up developing into that, this metabolic syndrome, these basket of issues um, that people get and the diseases that come from them. So can you talk to us about what is insulin and then what is insulin resistance? Yes. So maybe if I may just take one little step back. Um, I recently um, wrote a blog about this calories in and calories out um, because, um, you know, there are two kind of theories about, you know, what is the issue with weight? I mean, it's very specific on weight. So the calories in, calories out became very popular after the Second World War. And all the main dietary programs out there use this concept. Now, you as, um, you know, fitness instructor and so on will know how difficult it is to burn 2,000 calories a day with exercise. I think it's almost impossible. I don't know what you have to well, do. To well, well, I think I, you can't because you have like a base metabolic rate and you have, you know, you might be that if you're weightlifting, the more muscle you can put on, the more muscle you'll be, the more calories you'll be generally burning throughout the day it's not too hard i mean our brain is is using a lot of energy anyway as long as you're reasonably active and you're depending on your size but there's a huge variation on size and metabolic yes. met metabolic rate so all i want to say about that it's it's not that simple the 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 next problem with calories in and calories out that is based on laboratory experiments of how much energy is generated when you burn one gram of fat or uh, protein or carbohydrates. The problem is that our body doesn't know what the calorie is. It can't measure a calorie. It is, it's of no use to the body. The body can only recognize the components of the macronutrients that I just mentioned. So whether it's glucose, whether it's, whether it's amino acid, uh, or a fatty acid. That's what our body measures. And the body's response is not equal to these three things. Because what the body does, it releases a hormone. Um, now, many hormones, but let's stick with insulin. Um, and the reason why the body releases insulin when we eat and the and our digestive system breaks down these food into their components, is it needs to then import, uh, especially glucose into cells for energy. But it's not an equal response. Uh, insulin is released after carbohydrates and sugar, which all break down to glucose in very high amounts, much higher than when um, in response to protein or fat. The other thing about uh, insulin is any additional glucose that we take in is stored as fat. It's also called the fat storage hormone. So if we know all of that, we can already very easily think that if we eat a lot of carbs and sugar, there's gonna be excess glucose. And that glucose is going to be stored as fat. It's just a physiological thing that's going to happen. And doesn't matter what the calorie count is. It, it, it's about the type of food that you eat that's driving the process. And these are the two theories. The hormonal one is becoming much more in the mainstream, you know, these days. Previously, people did not even pay any attention to, to that model. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, you know, just sort of anecdotally, you can see so many people who have tried for years and years and years to lose weight by just counting calories and not changing the structure of their diet. And then ev eventually they say, right, I can't do this anymore. And then they, something changes and they decide to change the structure of their diet. And most people then stop counting calories but they increase their fat and protein intake and reduce their carbohydrate intake. And hey, presto, the fat starts to come off. The body is able to access its fat storage. You have a reversal of the body saying, I need to store fat all the time to I'm going to access this fat all the time. So can you tell us how people might 
you know, instigate that with their diet? How is this food impacting? You've said that, you know, more carbohydrate will, will, or the glucose that's broken down will increase the amount of insulin uh, being released. So how can people influence their diet, influence this insulin resistance with their diet? I wonder if maybe Izzy's got a great story about how she did it, maybe as an example, and then we can chat about that, uh, you know, just w what happened to her. And, definitely, and, definitely. And what her belief was about what to eat and how she changed it. I'd love to okay. hear it. Um, I, I'll happily tell you what is really my case study. Uh, I'll have to leave it to Escalita to explain medically, but uh, <laughs> really, we, actually, we were just talking about this this morning because we're actually doing another talk from somebody who asked a specific question, is what changed? And m my health issues, which was actually, I, I didn't know what it was to begin with, but if you've been listening to the podcast up to now, you'll know what it was. I was actually <laughs> eating the wrong things. My health journey or a downward health spiral actually occurred first of all about 15 years ago um i was um i was actually doing pretty well i thought um i had an active life all was good um i had high energy i was a bit tired i must admit and i was a little chubby around my waist um so that's perhaps two two clues um <laughs> 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 I'm honest about it. It's okay. <laughs> I'm a grandmother. I've reached the age when I can actually be honest. <laughs> at, the, at, at the time, I was in denial. However, my belief system at that time was that I should uh, eat less uh, red meat, uh, more lean meat, uh, follow a low fat diet, and actually perhaps a little bit more vegetarian might not go amiss. And this is what I'd been told by doctors and nutritionists probably for the last 15 years prior to that. Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. What that... Uh, it manifested itself in, in my body was I collapsed twice in within a week. Um, I was blue lighted to um, A and E. Um, the first time I, I went there, they thought I was drunk. I, I wasn't, but uh, that's what they thought. You you, um, you, fe I, you fainted or I, I passed out. I collapsed completely. I was at wow. a charity function. I was actually speaking at a charity function. I didn't feel well. I, I finished my talk. I went outside. I was found in the car park unconscious. Wow striking yes it was uh <laughs> um That's scary it was, it was very scary uh i came to with an oxygen mask on propped up against the wall uh waiting for, for waiting for the ambulance i don't remember another thing probably for the next hour um i woke up in a and e i only knew where i was because i i recognized the accent of glasgow um, which isn't my home city, but that's where I was. Yeah. We had a Glaswegian uh, on the podcast the other day, actually. It's quite <laughs> di distinctive. <laughs> yeah. I love them dearly. <laughs> anyway, um, the doctor took one look at me and said, she's drunk. I, I could hardly speak. Um, I wasn't drunk. Um, I was put on about four or five meds and sent home. Uh, two, two or three days later, I was uh, somewhere else. Um, I was actually at the chiropractor. Um, and I was just telling him about what happened. And the next thing I knew, I was whisked off in an ambulance again. I'd uh, passed out um, and I was on my way to another hospital where I was prescribed some more meds. Now, the, the journey back from that particular, those two particular episodes was quite a while. I mean, it took me months to really recover. And I, I don't think actually I really actually regained my health properly. Um, if we could fast forward on quite a few years, maybe about sort of eight to 10 years, um, more events started to happen. Um, I would, um, I, I could collapse in the street. I could collapse when I was flying. That was a, a you know, a, almost a given every time I flew anywhere, um, I fainted. Um, mm. I fell um, in the street a couple of times. I got, uh, I had a, two fractures as a result of those falls and the next thing that I could honestly say I felt, apart from terribly unwell and really, really tired, was I had a massive heart palpitations. And um, I, I was scared beyond belief. Um, I went to the doctor. We got a referral to a cardiologist. And the cardiologist said, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know what the problem is, but we're going to put in um, a continuous heart monitor. So I had a heart Is that monitor. quite a big, big uh a big deal do they have it uh, well it was it was it was it was, a, it was a sort of it was a big deal for me okay um, but is it above the skin I think I, above... I, it's just under the skin it's just a tiny little thing like a um uh just like a memory stick okay okay and it's it's, it's it, it sits 
or just if below it, if the it's skin? Un, un, under the skin, just, just above your heart. Okay. And so it monitors your heart performance. And he said, this, this will tell me what the problem is. I was desperate by this time. I felt awful. So we inserted it and they found out what the problem was pretty soon. And the problem was that actually my heart would stop beating. It just stopped. Bit of a problem. Bit of a problem. I thought it was a problem. I, I you know, I, I felt awful, but I, I felt even worse knowing this. <laughs> so, and I mean, it would restart, but I, you know. Well, that, just... no, that's, that's a bonus. <laughs> that's why, you, yeah. It's, it's pretty obvious. That's why I came. <laughs> but it was, it was scary. It was very mm. scary. Now, as it happens, Esther Lida had been studying nutrition quite extensively before this event. And she said to me, you know, I really think, as well as having this heart monitor in and them discovering what the problem is, I really think actually you should look carefully at your diet. Now, I'll be quite honest, I wasn't quite so enthusiastic about this message. However, <laughs> I had so several sort of what I might describe as life-changing events. So I thought, you know, I, I think I'll listen. It went against most of my belief system. Um, so, what it, so what did I do? Yes. <laughs> uh, these were the changes that I made. Um, <laughs> not always at day one, but however, uh, over a few weeks, these are the changes that progress, I made. not perfection. <laughs> it, it was progress. It was a step by step. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> so I um, I ate more protein, real meat, red meat. Um, so that was good. And I... Uh, started eating many more healthy fats, uh, butter, which I'd been brought up on but hadn't used recently, um, coconut oil, olive oil, um, green green veggies, um, and dairy. Yeah, dairy, full fat dairy, or all, all full fat dairy. I was brought up on a farm, so I was quite used to dairy until somebody told me that soya would be better. Terrible mistake, but um, close your ears, everyone. Close your ears. <laughs> I know. No, absolutely. I mean, please close your ears to that one. Um, and I, I followed this program within days. These were the results. My brain fog started to disappear. Now, I didn't know I had brain fog before. I, I just wasn't thinking very clearly, but I could actually, it was like, it's like a cloud lifting from my, my head. Um, that was the first thing that I noticed. Um, I started to lose weight. I lost about half a kilo a week. Um, which was good news. I lost seven kilos in, in total, which is fine for me. Um, but the biggest thing of all, um, and I had much more energy and I could sleep. I was sleeping properly. Uh, that, that was a good start for me. I'm not very good without sleep. Um, the best thing of all was when the heart monitor said that actually my heart was performing 100% again. Wow. And I was... I was alive. And how um, long How long a period was that when you changed your diet to having that? Four and a half months. Four and a half months. Okay. Four and a half months from beginning to, I mean, I still follow that the, these principles, but from when I, the day one to I started to yeah. the, the day that actually it really has been performing was four, four and a half months. And how and, long had you been living with the sort of fainting and passing out and heart palpitations? Years, years. Wow. And the other thing was the best thing, well, apart from the fact that I was alive, that was the best thing, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I was I was off all uh, blood pressure medication. My blood pressure was back down at normal, whereas it had been sky high. Amazing. Amazing. So yeah. as you can hear, Finn, very simple changes mm. if you prepare to implement them rigor rigorously. Yeah. yeah. It, it has a huge impact and you can understand why the medical establishment might not want people doing this. It's pretty obvious. I mean, immediately there goes all your doctor's consultations. There go all of your medications. There go all of your escalating health issues. There goes your um, care home facility care when you get dementia or Alzheimer's or you know, when you have to have, I mean, God forbid these, I mean, Gary Fetke talks about the sound of people having amputations because of diabetes. So all of that sort of starts to disappear. And I, you know, where does that leave the, the profits for the pharmaceutical industry? 
And it's not just the pharmaceutical industry. Um, as we know, health systems across the world are collapsing because of the number of, of chronic cases that they can't handle. Mm -hmm. But it's also the food and drugs, in uh, sorry, food and drinks industry, because um, you have to cut out processed food and drinks, fizzy drinks, uh, you know, fruit juices, and anything that you buy in the supermarket that's either wrapped in a packet uh, or in a tin, anything that's got a list of ingredients, mm. those are the things that you need to get out of your life. So, I mean, we're talking about billion dollar industries here. Yeah. And yeah. marketing of millions of dollars. It's huge. It's huge. And and Izzy, when you were going into your into the doctor and, and you were, you know, for all these issues, what they were saying, because they immediately identified the heart and they said, look, the, the issue is here. But really, obviously, the issue was the diet. What advice were you getting from the doctor in, in terms of what to eat and what to drink and what to do? Um, none um, it is on diet at all. None. Not not a thing. There wasn't even a question asked. All I was really told um, from the beginning of this exercise to, and we're talking about maybe 15 years from beginning to end, um, all I was really told was you'll have to be on a high blood pressure medication for life and we will be increasing the dose. Do you understand that? Well, I don't know whether I did or I didn't understand it, but however, it, it, at the time, it seemed to reduce my blood pressure and it enabled me to live. Now, of course, I, uh, I've educated myself and I, I know more, but um, mm. there was no dietary advice given at all. Except by nutritionists. Well, nutritionists had given me advice, but it was the incorrect advice. I've already mentioned it before in this podcast and I vowed I wouldn't mention it again. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was in incorrect advice. <clears throat> <clears throat> and even if the advice had been given by my doctor, it would have been based on the on the eat well plate, which mm. is um, not what we should eat at all. Well, so, I mean, I've, I've heard that some doctors are slightly bound by that eat well plate by mm -hmm. the sort of the nice guidelines, NICE guidelines yeah. is sort of what they must. Uh, the, the information that is sort of sanctioned to be told to people and that is you know refer to the eat well plate or don't step outside your remit you know go refer to a diet dietitian or a nutritionist yeah i think if i can just mm -hmm. add so absolutely and in addition to that i mean we come on to cholesterol and statins we know that there are guidelines for doctors when to have that discussion uh, with their patients about total cholesterol values and here in the UK, I believe it's when you, the total cholesterol is above 5.1 millimoles per litre. Mm. The doctor has to have that discussion with their patient. So it's it's all in the guidelines for the doctors, um, you know, um, what they need to do. And can I just add on that sure. point, actually, that there was an article here in the, the British press last week where uh, doctors are now going to be able to uh, advise statins for anybody over the age of 18. It's really, really terrible. <laughs> it's, it's horrific. And and with statins, once you're on them, it's very hard to get off them. That's what I kind of... No, oh, I, I, I think you can just stop taking them because, you know, and many people do, even though, um, you know, they decided that, um, that themselves um, because of side effects. Mm. Um, and, you know, the press will carry on and say, you know, there are no really serious side effects uh, um, related to statin use. Um, that's not true. That's another misinformation. But I know of several people that have, you know, out of their own volition, stopped taking statins mm. because they they were feeling so poorly. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke to Ra Dr. Rachel Brown the other day. She's she's big on sort of carnivore, um, sort of as a carnivore doctor, a carnivore psychologist and psychiatrist, and. Um, she was telling me about how statins ultimately lower your overall cholesterol, but lowered overall cholesterol has many, many brain and mental side effects 
you know, you can, you can develop depression on statins. You can develop, um, it can exacerbate things like schizophrenia. It can exacerbate men or many mental disorders because our brain is so reliant on cholesterol. Like our, like our brain is something like 20% cholesterol or more. So all of our neurons are coated in cholesterol. I mean, we need cholesterol in abundance. Well, absolutely. And it's not just the brain, the brain, um, if you, you look at uh, 66% of the brain is made up of cholesterol and That's fats, it. Um, but cholesterol also for the rest of our body. I mean, every single cell membrane in the body um, has got cholesterol. It needs it to have structure. Secondly, it's the basis for most of our hormones. For instance, all our sex hormones need cholesterol as, as, as the basic building block. Um, our go, um, gallbladder needs cholesterol for bile, bile uh, salts. Um, vitamin D, the basis of that is cholesterol. And on and on it goes. Um, maybe something interestingly enough, um, you know, cholesterol is a substance that's actually made by our brain and by our livers. It's manufactured. So where, who's thought that the body will manufacture something that's harming it? It's because it's an essential component. And the other thing is in, in breast milk, it's got a very high cholesterol content. And you've mentioned it, the brain needs it. That baby's brain needs it. So why would breast milk contain cholesterol if it's bad? Mm. There's just no uh, logic to, to any of the arguments to, to the contrary. And there's no evidence for those arguments, I think, which is the main point here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if you can just, we can go back to, the science behind Izzy's story. I mean, could you tell us, Estralita, about why Izzy might have been passing out and these heart palpitations? What was the reason behind that? Well, she was obviously insulin resistant. And that's what you mentioned uh, a little while ago. The underlying condition is insulin resistance. That's never diagnosed. And that means that when your tissues become insulin resistant. It can't generate enough energy for whichever organ is affected. Now, it can be the brain, it can be the heart, it can be the muscles, on and on the list goes. And we know very typically that insulin resistance, um, you know, usually um, around 20 years when it's present, and um, that leads, can lead to diabetes, very typically and heart disease. Similarly, you know, after you've been insulin resistant for two, uh, two decades, one, two decades, the heart problems start. Um, uh, you know, high blood pressure is very common, but also the heart muscle, if it doesn't get enough energy because the mitochondria can't generate that amount of energy, your heart muscle is affected, you know, and it's possible that also the electrical currents in the heart may be affected and on and on it goes you know there are so many areas which still need to be um, investigated fully but we know that heart issues are uh, one of the complications of insulin resistance so exactly what her, her me mechanism was i'm not sure but we know that those conditions are linked to underlying metabolic abnormality Mm, mm, absolutely and and it's just it's this sort of sinister slow creep as things yeah. sort of start to go wrong so i mean it, you mentioned one methodology there of like measuring your sort of your waist circumference and then um it, it's weight well, I, by height yeah yes so it's almost like a, a a a slightly deeper level of sort of almost a bmi measurement well, the reason why we don't use the BMI is, as you know, when people go to the gym and they build a lot of muscle, the BMI doesn't work that well. This cuts that out completely because it's just weight by height. <clears throat> it's very simple, very easy to do. Yeah. And 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 on from there, I mean, I, I've worked with clients before who are overweight already, 
And we want to get a gauge of their metabolic health as things improve, but that waist measurement doesn't necessarily tell us much if they've only lost an inch yeah. and they're sort of a 40 inch waist anyway. I mean, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but we want to see whether their blood glucose is responding well to the foods that we're eating. So I've often asked people to use a, to buy, we, they're, they're everywhere now because so many people are diabetic, these sort of fasting blood glucose monitors. And you can do a finger prick blood test at home and you get a reading of how you're fasting blood glucose. So, I mean, would you recommend people go and get any other blood tests or do any of these tests to get a, le a deeper level to understand their progress in, the, in this battle to get um, less insulin resistant? I think I think um, it's a very good idea. Um, and that's why we also developed what we call a metabolic health assessment. And that's to dive a little bit deeper using um, not only the waist height measurement, but look at laboratory data. And the laboratory data that we look at are really um, the very basic markers. So we look at liver function tests. We look at your lipid profile, which has got your cholesterol and your triglyceride levels in it. And we also look at hemoglobin A1c which is your three month glucose value. I mean, the, the, the daily testing and after eating glucose values are very important to, to help people understand how their glucose spikes so that they can amend what they eat. So excellent. Um, but we use the three month value because I think it gives me more information on um, what's been going on for the past three months. Mm -hmm. And based on those information, as well as a questionnaire about um, medical history and dietary history, um, we then compile a report that actually look at cardiovascular risk, risk of insulin resistance, risk of diabetes, inflammation risk and so on. There's a lot of additional markers that people can uh, submit as well. But the ones that I've mentioned is enough to do a basic metabolic health assessment. So we often, we also recommend that people when they start do that because that can give them a very strong indication that they are A, maybe already insulin resistant and that they may have a cardiovascular risk in the red category already. And I think that's a very strong motivation. And then after three to six months on, um, you know, a program where they restrict their carbohydrates, et cetera, we can redo this assessment. And it's amazing to see the difference, for instance, in the reduction in cardiovascular risk, reduction in liver fat and so on. If you look at these laboratory markers. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And, and that's where it becomes real for people. Because oftentimes yeah. when they implement these changes, they might not be measuring anything. They might just be saying, oh, I need to eat more animal fats. Oh, I need to you know, reduce my carbohydrates. And they do it for a week, but they haven't measured where they are and where they're yeah. going. So then it becomes very much a case of mental motivation. And But when you see these numbers in black and white changing, it's like, wow, like lights come on. Not, I mean, not just metaphorically, I mean, literally the brain fog lifts, as you're saying, is he like, but you're seeing it on paper and you're seeing like, I'm actually getting healthier and I need to continue this. And it's having a real impact. Absolutely. And uh, on our website, um, on the metabolic health assessment page, we've got an example there of what we do a, a risk profile radial chart uh, for people as well. So they can see on a single chart the different aspects and the risk associated with that. So it's a very visual thing. And um, I think it's a it's a very easy thing to understand and then to compare. Now, the, the finger prick blood glucose give you instantaneous value of what you need to do. Um, but some of these markers are not instantaneous. You know, it can take days, weeks, some even months to, to get into a healthy uh, region. Uh, with regard to risk mm. but that's why this is not a diet this is a lifestyle change mm. that people need to understand mm. absolutely absolutely with well, that yeah <clears throat> it's the, the half the battle with many people isn't it showing that this is not a quick fix for anything this is like 
you're not just trying to drop a dress size to get to a wedding. You're not just trying to, you know, beef up for a boxing match. Like this is, this is a life changing because it needs to be a lifestyle because this stuff is so insidious and changes so slowly over time and really erodes your health. And I wanted to touch on another area of the book that's very, very popular at the moment. And that's seed oils, industrial seed oils that are processed and you know they go through all these different processes in order to make them palatable for human consumption and seed oils i'm talking about are things like canola oil rapeseed oil um sunflower seed oil all these uh, grape seed oil is a terrible one lots of offcuts from the from the wine industry so i want if you can just lay out why we need to be focusing on animal fats rather than seed oils so they're the cheaper seed, seed things to cook with you want to give a medical now to give an example yeah so basically what what we need to eat is real food food that's there not that humans produce because you've already mentioned the industrial processes that we need to make vegetable and seed oils i mean these are not things that are natural they've got a lot of chemicals bleach you know toxins uh, the process is so toxic that they need to produce these things. And what we know, I mean, there are more and more side effects that people realize what's happening by consuming these. And it's almost ubiquitous now in all the processed food uh, items they use because it's cheap, these um, oils. Um, and even if you go to a restaurant, they almost all use these oils to cook your food in. Um, but they're highly inflammatory and, um, you know, impact many of our organ systems. So it's not real food. It's man-made food. It's man-made made polyunsaturated fats and it's toxic. So those are things that we need to cut out of our diet completely. And I mean, um, Izzy's got another little story because as her gut's health improved on this um, uh, nutrition program, she became much more sensitive to these things. I don't know if you want to mention. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I, for example, um, cannot now actually eat anything that uses uh, any any of the vegetable oils that you, you mentioned. Um, now, I didn't know this before, and it may be that actually I've just become much more sensitive to it. But I'll give you just in, in the form of a story, it's like a foretelling story. Um, we went to a restaurant one day, a uh, very, very nice chain of restaurants in, in the UK. So it's really, really nice steaks. Okay. And, Which one is it? Uh, Which chain? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, no one's no one's gonna see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um there were, we had a special request. I, I request actually anywhere I go now, I, I refuse to eat food if it's actually using any form of processed oil. I, I, I'd rather actually eat at home. Mm -hmm. Now, some people said that's very fussy, but if they, if they knew what happened after five hours, it's like a vicious IBS attack for me. So um, we went to this restaurant. I didn't want to create a scene. Eventually they said, well, we'll we can only do it in, in rapeseed oil. So I, I should perhaps have said, no, thank you. But however, I said, yes. And five hours later, sure, I had, you know, just a violent, violent IBS attack. And that, that happens. That That is what actually happens wow. now. So I can quite happily have, you know, olive oil or butter or actually coconut oil. Mm. Um, and those three are my staples. And if I can't have food prepared in that, I, I won't eat it. Wow. And, and there's, I, so many, there's, there's so many aspects now, you know, restaurants use so many pre-prepared sources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there, these vegetable oils are mainly in <laughs> these processed foods that they're using, which, I mean, the restaurant's a lovely restaurant, but if they're actually using a pre-prepared source that actually has vegetable mm. oil in, I cannot eat it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, actually, I'd heard that um, even McDonald's used to, to fry their chips, their fries in mm -hmm. beef tallow. Yes. Like, Cause they had all these pat these burger patties and they would just use the beef tallow for that. And I, and that used to be great, but then there was a huge switch. I think in the, it was either seventies, eighties, nineties. I don't know when exactly it was, but they will switch to, you know, on the basis of heart health, they will <laughs> switch to, I think canola or rapeseed and, and, you know, and then 
lots of other companies and big restaurant chains were sort of forced to follow suit after because and then everyone was asking like what do you fry your everyone was asking for preferential to preferentially to have this stuff fried in these vegetable oils i hate the term vegetable oils because they're not vegetables it's a complete marketing scam it's another marketing scam but i mean we were on holiday fairly recently and we were just actually taking a walk probably sort of after breakfast time, though we don't eat breakfast, but just to give you a rough idea of what the mm. time was. And we were watching the deliveries coming in at the back of these restaurants. And, you know, the, the huge tumps, cans of, um, you know, rapeseed rape seed oil coming in. I mean, you know, 25 gallon cans, it looked like, mm. you know, absolutely enormous, about five of them being delivered each time. And you're thinking, mm, well, yeah. won't be eating there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and it's interesting what you should should say about, the sort of sensitivity changing in your body once it sort of almost has like a detox period it mm-hmm. realizes what this this these substances are doing to it i mean not you, you've got the layer that you're talking about there with seed oils and that giving you ibs but then i've also you know myself included and many people i say look and many of my clients i say look just have a week off like just just the added sugar carbohydrates we're talking about yes. like you can still have some of the root vegetables and stuff you can still have some of these slightly higher carbohydrate vegetables like that's fine but just drop out the ice cream and the, the sodas and just try it for a week and then add it back in and one see how sweet it tastes mm-hmm. and two see how it makes you feel it might make you feel lightheaded because it's giving you this bang this big sugar release and sugar burst and then they'll start to realize hang on i'm living in this state all the time i'm living in this sort of foggy sugar induced high the whole time and it's actually i feel weird when i don't have the sugar so it's like once you can just get them to see behind that curtain and like you have is you've seen behind the curtain and you're like i'm never going back there like that's that's what we need to get across to people Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a very strong and powerful message that, um, but added to that is the fact actually that regrettably, most of us will have to take control of our own health because there's, there's no one else. I mean, I was lucky to have a speaker to advise me. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I count my blessings every day for that, but mm. you know, we have to take control ourselves because th- there's, there's nobody else who is prepared to do it. So it's like, you know, you know, if we want to become fitter, you know, we, we, we come to you, mm-hmm. you know, but if you want to become healthier and understand what lifestyle is about, you know, food for lifestyle. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, we've, we've heard about a bit about the change of uh, Izzy's mindset there. So Estralita, in terms of how you used to work with patients, you were in the sort of medical world before, like, do you, what do you think back on your time in the medical world and, and versus now? Well, I must. Uh, I mentioned that I I worked in the pharma industry before I changed kind of uh, you can say careers, mm-hmm. um, and when I first encountered some of the ideas that we've discussed today um, about fat and cholesterol, um, I I thought that this is a bunch of crazy people. You know, that's uh, putting out all these information. And Misinformation. I thought, <laughs> yes. And I thought to myself, well, I will read the signs because I've got a research career. Uh, let me read the signs and make up my own mind. It took me only to read half a book that somebody wrote. And I knew, oh, my goodness, something is going on here. And I must say, for the last seven years, I haven't stopped my own research. And it's just building and building and building. And the reason why I wrote that book was because I I became so angry about the pervasive misinformation um, to the medical community as well as the general public. And it is, we know where it's fueled from. We know it's all about power and money and all of those things we also cover some of that in the book um but you know we need to inform the public let people then make their own choices and sometimes you have to make a choice that's unpopular with your friends with your family and sometimes even with your gp but if you really want to be healthy and you you know i just say try it try it for three weeks 
and you'll see the difference. And if you don't see a difference after three weeks, do what you want to. But, you know, give yourself the chance to, mm-hmm. to do something different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, there's, <clears throat> that, that's what many many people who are sort of against this this way of thinking and this 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 these concepts often roll back around to you know where are your randomized controlled trials where's your x y and z like where's your like gold standard research and hang on like we have millions of people out here who've changed their diet in this ways and reversed their type 2 diabetes they've reversed their hypertension they've reversed their you know that they've that we've seen ketogenic diets improving alzheimer's and dementia symptoms like that's a pretty big signal around the link between diet and brain function at the very least we should change that round because the science is there the randomized uh, studies are there to yeah. prove what we're talking about the problem is that the data to say you shouldn't eat fat and fat and cholesterol actually cause heart disease there's not data for that there's only loose epidemiological data that is not significant. Um, so it's actually the, the shoe is on the other foot. Mm. There's no data to support, um, you know, the dietary guidelines. Absolutely no verifiable scientific data to support that. That's a powerful note to finish on. Estralita and Izzy, thank you so much for talking to me today. Where can people find your book, where can they buy it? And where can they find more information about both of you? Well, they can, I think the easiest is our website, www.wellnesseq, uh, just the E and the Q at the end, dot net. Our book, Eat Well or Die Slowly, is on Amazon. So, yeah. <laughs> there it is from oh, both snap. sides of the world. <laughs> snap. <laughs> and there's a lot of information on our website um, about us. Um, we've written a lot of blogs on different topics um, and yeah, the, the, uh, the different programs that we offer that may be of interest. So there's a lot of information. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank oh, you. Can, can I, can, can sure, I just sure. say something? Of Thank you so much. We, we really have enjoyed that. This hour has literally shot by um yeah. it's been such a great pleasure to talk to you thank you yes no, thanks, thanks. absolute pleasure to have you guys on i love you guys's message and um like i love that you're putting out a, a book that's so digestible for people and leads people through i mean just to give a quick a quick summary on some of the areas they touch on you touch on the science you touch on the corruption behind stuff you touch on the diseases that are coming out you touch on you know, some of the work with some of these anthropologists around the development of how we got to the paleo diet and agricultural industry coming on. I mean, it's, it's a conclusive and, and, um, you know, easily accessible read for people to get their heads around, like how this has come about, how we got to the dietary guidelines and how we're so lost here and what the answer is. So no, I think it's, I think it's a great message you guys have, and I'd be happy to have you on again, you know, and hear how things have progressed for you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Sven.